Hey everyone, I'm going to use the OBD splitter that I showed in one of the previous videos that basically creates two outlets from one OBD port. So I can connect this to the car and then the sniffer device goes to uh, one of the outlets just like that. The other port will be used later. So let's start with a simple example first. I will try to cache the messages from this button and as you can see if I push it up or down the selection changes on the screen so we will try to catch this action. I've got the Arduino connected to the OBD port and my laptop and it's set to the low speed canvas. So then what I will do is I will connect to it and then I will start sniffing. As you can see there are a bunch of messages coming in. If you wait a second there are actually 29 messages. And in theory, when I push this button, there will be a new one uh, if the button has not been pressed since the first message. So when I push the button, uh, as you can see, there is a new message arrived, this 175. So we can, you know, make a guess that this 175 packet is generated because of that button press. So now I will just put it in here, so only the 175 packages will appear in the main window. I clear the window now and I can actually highlight the new data as well and if I push the button now there you go you can see the message arrived and the changes uh, get highlighted with pink so if I push the button down and hold it there you can see the packet and then I release it and push it up that is the packet for that so you can see the changes in the payload so to confirm that this is the package we need we can do a really clever thing so first actually Let's say that I'm sure that this is uh, this 175 packet is the multimedia button, so I can give it a, a name, like let's say multimedia, and let's save the packet to the dictionary. So if I clear the window once more, and I press the button, it now will be highlighted with green. So let's go back and allow this message only again. I want to catch the, the button up message again. So I will push it and then I click on the add to the decoded list button. So now in the decoded table that packet is the, the one that we have found. So I can give it a new name like menu button up. And here comes the fun part. Uh, let's scroll down a little bit on the screen. Then I will select the show takes table checkbox and then I will add uh, the packet to the takes table below. After that we will be able to send it to the radio and we should see the selection jump the same way as we push the button. So let's send it and there you go, uh, it does the job as we expect. I can do the same with the button down. So I hold it there, add it to the decoded list, I go back and I can rename it to menu button down. And I will add it to the sending table as well. Now I can send these packets to the car. So you can see that this is up and down, down. As you would imagine, you can just continue this procedure with all the buttons here. So let me clear the table again. So there are a bunch of buttons on the steering wheel, right? So I can actually also push the center of this selector button. And you can see that that is the push and release, push, release. So if I hold it down like that, and I can add this message to the, to the table, and I can give it a new name, like menu button push. And you can continue this with the other buttons as well. This is four zero. This is five zero. This is zero four. This is zero five. And I can do the same for volume. So I hold it down. I can add it to the decoded list. And then push up. I can add it to the decoded list as well. So the first one was volume down. And then this one is volume up. Let's continue with a more difficult one. Let's say we want to continue the reverse engineering and continue with the light switch. 
So I just press start sniffing again and you can clearly see that there are some packets uh, that are constantly changing. Let's assume that those packets are for uh, some systemic level of things that you don't really care about right now. So what I can do is I can add um, those packages, this uh, 500 and this uh, 108 and then also add this one, this 440 and then this one too, 130 and then lastly this 115 so we've added these to the height packets so if we clear the table again uh, we should not see those packages anymore so it will be much easier to see any new packets so let's say uh, that we need to get the light switch messages so two things can happen um, the same way as with the multimedia buttons the packet will appear as a new packet or the controller for the light switches is already listed here and that's where the highlight new packet button is extremely handy because if I now do any action with the light switch, boom, you can see that uh, a bunch of things happened. We have seen new packets here but also previous packages changing so we are not sure at this stage uh, what packet is responsible for the light switch. So I can continue switching the knob and you can see that a bunch of packets are changing but there is only one that is changing for every stage, which is this uh, 23A packet. So my assumption is that 23A is referring to the light switch, so I just save it for now. The reason for the other packages to change is that when I change the switch to auto, it immediately triggers the whole backlighting and maybe other things in my car. So that is the reason why you see more messages changing and not just that one. Yep, so let's try that out. Let's add it to the show packet list. And then uh, when I turn the knob, the values are changing according to the state. So we have successfully tracked the light switch as well. Since we were talking about it, uh, let's do the background LED brightness. So we try to change the brightness level of the background LED. So I turn the switch down and you can see that there is one value changing and this is a cool example because it's really simple to understand and decode it. Let's say that 235 is the brightness that I saved to the dictionary now, so... That's 235. This is the minimum value. Uh, and if I turn it up, the value increases immediately. So it's extremely easy to understand it and the end value is FF, which stands for 255. So that was another really easy one that we could uncover. The next example can be a different method. As you've seen, the buttons are, when pressed, emitting information. But what if I want to ask for some specific information? For example, um, we will try to track the RPM. So let's make sure that the sniffer has been put into the high speed cam mode now and the frequency has been increased too. Then we have to take a look at PID queries. The bottom of this Wikipedia page tells you that we can start the query for a specific PID code if we send this message to this ID and we can expect the response in this format from one of these IDs. The top of this page also lists uh, a whole bunch of PID codes that you can check. If you remember, this is exactly what the Arduino example code did. It did a query for all of these PIDs and displayed the available ones. You have to keep in mind that your car will probably support just a subset of these IDs. Let's say if you want to get the RPM now. So now we know that we need to send 7DF ID to the engine with these parameters, where the 02 is the number of the following bytes. 01 is um, that I want to see the current values and then the last value 0c is the RPM So I put it in here in the transmit table and it's also good practice to check these values every so often So let's say every 400 milliseconds. I already know that the feedback packet will be 7e0 So I put it here So when I select the packet and push the send button here, you can see the reply message with that ID and it periodically gets received based on the period that we have set here previously. You can see that there is only one value changing currently and if I slowly push the throttle down the RPM increases 
and so do these values. You can see that both of these two bytes change. That's because this is a two byte value and the Wikipedia page also tells you how to decode it to get the actual RPM. Actually we can decode these bytes based on the Wikipedia page. So the first byte that 04 tells you that four bytes will follow that one. The next one, which is 41 in this case, is uh, 40 hex greater than the request was, which you know tells you that uh, this is the response for the 01. And then the next one, or the third byte, uh, 0C is exactly the same 0C as it was in the request, so it tells you that it has to be decoded as, uh, as an RPM value. And the following two is basically the, the value itself. So that is one more example of how you can transmit and then get back some specific information. The next really cool thing is when you have an official service device for your car, you can do a bunch of more things other than, you know, the regular buttons because the service software allows you to put the individual modules in the testing mode, for example, and you can read fault codes back to. Now I want to show you how to read those fault codes yourself. This computer is running the official diagnostic software and the hardware has been attached to the other part of the OBD splitter. These softwares will look differently for specific car brands, but the functionalities should be similar. Now, as a quick test, I will try to read the errors stored in the ECU. As you can see, we have one stored uh, fault code here. Now I will refresh this list again and with the sniffer we can listen to the messages that the service software transmitted to the car and we can also capture the reply from that particular module. Let's try to catch this message from the device. So I start sniffing and remember that we are on the high speed can now again and I let the packages come in and settle down. I will click on the refresh list button that starts the reading procedure again. As you can see, at least three packages have been received here, and we can assume that these three are responsible for the fault code reading. So what I will do is I will filter for these messages, which were 7E0, 7E8, and then 5E8. Cool, let's clear the table again. This is a good example where the waterfall view can come very handy because you can actually see the order of these messages. So I just click on the refresh list again. Let's spend some time figuring out what happened. Obviously the first message is the one that the software transmitted and it's really important because this payload tells that very module that hey I want to see your fault codes and this ID is specific for one of the modules in the engine because fault codes are stored in distributed modules so not in one place. If you send this payload to the other modules you can read those too. This message contains the actual fault code and you can get some help from the same Wikipedia page about how you can decode it. They are called Diagnostic Trouble Codes or DTCs. I have not recorded other modules now but this is an older picture about another module. This was the request, um, these two are two fault codes and this last uh, empty one indicates the end of the fault code reading. The next really fun feature of these diagnostic tools are the output tests. If you look through the menu you might find some specific modules now we are in the instrument cluster, where you can do some output tests. For example, if you select the RPM control, this will be a test for the RPM gauge in the instrument cluster. So if I increase this value, you can see that the needle is moving as well. This is actually how I did the control from my app. I've listened to these packets and eventually I was able to play with the needles. Let it go back to the idle state and let's try to catch it from the software. So I start sniffing once again and now I'm on the low speed cam by the way. I highlight new packets, highlight new data and I hide the controls, scroll down a little bit and then let's trigger it again. Ah uh, yes, at the bottom both of these are changing. This 255 and then 655. Let's clear it again. Oh, and actually let's do the waterfall view again. You can see that these packages arrive periodically because I'm still in the testing mode currently. Uh, but if I exit the test mode, I think these packages uh, stop arriving. Yep, they do. 
So you need to set the instrument cluster into testing mode and send these messages periodically. I'll just trigger it again. The 255 is being transmitted from the software and I think the 655 is the response to that message. Um, let's maybe send some new values and you can see that if I just stop here you can see that these values are definitely changing so these are the values that the software is transmitting and these are the values that are responsible for the RPM gauge to change so actually we can try to transmit it back and see uh, whether it's working or not so let's add it to the decoded table and let's try to send it back We, we need to start the sniffing first and there you go, the needle jumped to 2000. So this 07 seems to be correlated with 2000. If you wait a couple of seconds I think it will get back to normal, but if not that's fine too, because uh, I can just exit this mode, I believe by uh, let's get the package again. Yes, uh, this must be the exit command, 0, 2, double A's and all zeros, and you can see that the needle went back. I encourage you to find out what functionalities you can do with your car. I will show you one last fun thing within the immobilizer, which is the sound test. With this you could play sounds from your OBD2 device. Thanks for watching this episode from my car hacking series. You can find the GitHub repo down in the description and let me know if you need more of these videos.